We have been for some time uh, discussing out of Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God, and we've been talking about spiritual warfare. Today we're, we're going to begin to change this over just a little bit, but the reason we're changing, I guess it's really not a change, it's more flowing right into, in my mind, what's the obvious next topic that we need to be addressing. We're going to be talking about prayer for the next several weeks. Um, as, as, we deal, as we deal with prayer, the reason this is like a natural progression is because when you're reading Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 20, Paul winds up this whole idea of putting on the armor, then he'll tell us five times, he'll say, and pray, and pray, and pray, and pray, and pray. Now in Scripture, anytime something is said once, you should pay attention to it. If it's said twice, you really need to pay attention to it. If it's said three times, if you're not paying attention to it, you've completely missed it. That's why, like over in the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah is talking about God and seeing God high and lifted up, and he says he is, he doesn't say he is holy. See, in Isaiah's eyes, God is not holy. In Isaiah's eyes, God is not holy, holy. In Isaiah's eyes, God is holy, holy, holy. When he looks at God and sees God in all of his majesty, this one word just continues out of his mouth. He's telling us something. God is greater than you can ever imagine. He is holier than the word holy will even describe. So we just say it over and over and over. He's telling us something by that repetition. Paul is telling us something by the repetition in Ephesians 6. He's telling us, you're to pray, 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 and pray. And so we started off last week talking about how our lives, because we are in relationship with Christ, our lives are in this regular pattern of prayer. Not a regular schedule of prayer, before meals, at bedtime, that kind of thing, when things are difficult, but that our lives 24-7 are to be in communication and in relationship with God so that whatever we're saying, all communication is coming as a prayer to God. We're living in this state of prayer so much so that I told you last week that we live in prayer so much that when you lay down and draw your last breath on this earth, probably appropriate for those of us who are following Jesus, is that the last word out of your mouth is amen. Your life has been a prayer. You have been walking in that kind of communion with the Father. So since prayer is the centerpiece of this armor, and since we're commanded over and over to pray, then I want to spend some time talking about prayer. And here's, here's the questions we're going to cover over the next few weeks. And I'm not really bound to a schedule as far as a preaching schedule so that if you have a question that arises about prayer, if there's something that you want addressed, you would like to know a little more about, then I invite you to text or message me or Cindy or you can uh, text the phone number at The Rock and we'll get the text there, 357-3396 and uh, you, we, we'll get your text and we'll look at it and, and I, don't, I don't mind to discuss those things from the pulpit whatsoever. So if those are, if you have questions arise, that'll be great. Uh, you, you can ask those questions. But here's the five we're going to deal with for sure. Does God ever get tired of hearing our prayers for the same thing? Does he ever just grow weary of you continually coming back to him? Oh God, here I am again, same thing. Over and over and over. That's what we're going to do today. Uh, does God ever tell us to stop praying? Does he ever tell us to stop praying? We'll deal with that next week. Uh, if God already knows the outcome, then why pray? Uh, we'll deal with that. Does, God, d does prayer change God's mind? We'll deal with, does prayer change God's mind? And then we'll deal with, uh, what does fasting have to do with prayer? 
Now, one of the reasons why I have that down as, as the last one is simply because fasting for me, I understand it, I get it, I've read about it, but there's a part of it I don't understand as well. And so I'm, I, I want to work through that a little bit. I, I look forward to the challenge of just working through that to where um, I can stand up here and talk like it makes sense to me. Because I figure if it makes sense to me, then it'll make sense to you. Because uh, Listen, you, get, you got a pastor here who, who spends his life not getting past this simple truth. Jesus loves me, this I know. I may not know all the answers to all the big questions, but I know that he loves me. And I walk in that simple faith. And I believe that simple faith, as Jesus would say, the faith of a child is what saves us. And so... That's, that's the guy that's standing up here. Uh, so today we're going to deal with the first question, does God ever get tired of hearing our prayers for the same thing? Before I read this passage of scripture, I need to give you a little background. You have to have this picture in your mind because he's going, Jesus is going to tell us a parable about prayer. And, and he already, he's going to tell us at the very start the point of the story before he tells the story. In the, in the Roman justice system, in the Roman justice system, it was a very crooked system. The judge was a judge who, who was appointed by the Roman government, and the government just wanted him to keep peace, and that was it. He had the authority to rule, and his word was final. But he didn't respect God. He could care less about you. He could care less about the people in front of him at his court. He could care less about anybody except himself. And so how do you get a judge like that to listen to you and to rule for, uh, for, for something that you've brought before him? Well, the way they did that back then, if you wanted the judge to move and to rule, the judge would have to be bribed. You would have to be able to offer him something. And if it was something that he wanted, then he would rule for you, or and not necessarily in your favor, but he would certainly take your case uh, if, if you had nothing to offer him, then you were going to be in trouble simply because he wasn't going to hear your case and you weren't going to get justice. Are you with me so far? You got a crooked judge that wanted bribed. And this is the way the Roman justice system worked. Now, in the story we're about to hear, there's going to be a woman approach the judge. But this woman, the fact that she's a woman... In this time, that's not true today. What I'm about to say, this isn't, this isn't my mind. This is the culture of the day back in the Roman culture, and the Jews bought into this as well. A woman was not viewed as a person. She was not valued whatsoever as an individual. She wasn't viewed as someone made in the image of God. She was viewed as a possession. Therefore, as a possession, she had no rights of her own. She simply had to take whatever came her way. That's the culture in which Jesus lived, and that's the culture in which Jesus is telling this account that you're about to hear. Now you have a woman who's coming to the judge. and She has nothing to offer the judge. But worse than being a woman, she was a widow. So there was a time she was married... Her husband has died, and now she has absolutely nothing. She didn't have anything before, but now she really has nothing to bribe the judge. And it's with that in mind that we're going to read this in Luke 18. I'll start in verse 1. We're just going to go to verse 8, just eight verses. I know it's, it's dark in the room, but if you have your Bible or if you have the capacity to highlight some things, there are some things worth highlighting here. Verse 1, then Jesus told his disciples a parable, which is a story to uh, make a point. He told a parable to show them that they should always what? Pray. And, okay, so we already know the point of the story. We don't even need to read the story. Jesus is saying, always pray and don't give up praying. Always pray, don't give up. So we know the point he's going after. Verse 2. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. Roman judge. 
And there was a widow in that town who what? She kept coming to him with a plea. Grant justice against my adversary. Now see, she has nothing to offer. She just keeps coming to him with a plea. For some time he refused because she had nothing to offer. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow what? Because she keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. Now so that are two important words in the scripture. Always, anytime you come across a so that, you're getting ready to know the motive behind what's happening. So he's getting ready to give her justice for a reason, and it's really selfish, so that she won't eventually come and do what? Attack me. By the way, that word attack, the word attack is a picture word. He's, he's worried about this woman. Jesus is telling the story. This judge is worried about this woman because this woman is continually coming to him. And she keeps saying, you got to rule on my case. you got to rule on my case. She'd catch him when he was sitting on the ju judge's seat. She would catch him when he was taking his robe off and going home from work. She'd catch him when he'd lay his head down at night to sleep. She'd catch him when he woke up. She was, she was basically his breakfast music. Would you please rule on this case? Over and over and over, she came to him. And so finally he says, you know, I'm going to give this woman justice so that she will stop bothering me and so that uh, she won't attack me. The word there means so that she won't bust me in the nose. Yeah, he was scared of this woman. This, this woman was a pretty bold woman. Man, she, was, she was going after the judge and she was certain he was going to get busted in the nose. And the Lord said, this is verse 6, listen to what the unjust judge says. So we heard what he said. Then this, he says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on the earth? The quick point of the story is don't stop praying. That it's okay to continually bring the same request to God in the same way that this widow woman brought the same request to this judge over and over and over again. And then a deeper point of the story is this. If a pagan judge who doesn't fear God, he doesn't care about people, if he will grant her justice as evil as he is, how much more will the God who you love and who loves you and cares for you, how much more will he answer your requests? So she forced the hand of the evil judge, but this God who loves us and who we love when we pray, our prayer isn't falling on deaf ears. Our prayer isn't going to someone who doesn't have the capacity to answer. But he loves us. And so back to the main point. So keep praying and don't give up praying. This has been good for me because I, I mean many times in my life I have just wondered if, if God, it's not if he cares, it's just that Okay, am I just boring him to death? Am I just boring him to death? I, I remember a, uh, hearing about a pastor. A pastor who stood before his congregation and he was speaking on prayer and the first words out of his mouth on prayer was this, God is bored. God is bored, he said. And people looked at him, God is bored. Yeah, God's bored. Because we basically, we basically are down here going, God bless this, God bless that. And God goes, okay, you're blessed, that's blessed. God help this, okay, you're helped. And, 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 and we're just talking to God and asking Him to bless and bless and bless like He's supposed to just shower all this stuff down on us. He said, and then what really got God's attention is someone's finally prayed, God, use me. He's, and the way he said, he said, and God sat up. And his ears perked up. God, use me. 
Instead of trying to take something from God so that we can have our own desires satisfied, someone is saying, here I am, God, use me. You do what you want through me. Okay, I've always wondered if I hadn't bored God just a bit. Let me uh, deal with this. So why do we give up on praying? Why do we give up on praying? Have any of you given up on praying as far as you've been praying for something for a while and it's just kind of like, what's the use? Has anybody done that? Are you just afraid to put up your hand? Is your pastor the only one that's done this? Jeez. Okay. Well, if you've, if you've felt like giving up on praying, let me share some of the reasons. First of all, why I think this is, this is part of the reason. Number one is... We don't have the right view of God. If we've given up on praying, and I have at times over different things, if we've given up on praying, then I've lost my right view of God, who He is and what He's asked. Uh, there's different views of God. As you, you, have, you have God the heavenly genie, where you, you as a follower of Christ feel like you are able to just command things of God and demand things of Him to do certain things and to, to cause certain things to happen in your life. When you get that way, when I get that way, I find myself treating God like a genie, treating God like, okay, this is the way it's got. God, I need you to give me this. You don't understand, God, how, how much of a struggle I'm in right now. You don't understand what's going on in my life. I need, I need, I need. And we talk to God like we expect Him right then. And I'm not saying you don't pray with expectancy, but I'm saying that we find ourselves in a position where we're ordering God to do things. He's not our waiter. He is not our busboy. He's God. He is holy, 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 that guy who is over all. So a wrong view of God is to view God as this, this God that is going to be our heavenly genie that we just... Now, we don't say that out loud. We don't want to call God a heavenly genie, but that's kind of how we treat Him. We have the fairy tale God. We have the fairy tale God. God, my life is not exactly what it's supposed to be. You know... The glass slipper fit, but everything isn't happily ever after. As a matter of fact, everything's kind of a struggle right now, God, and I need you to come and make it nice. I need you, God, to come and make my life comfortable because it's not comfortable right now. I need you, God, to come and take this away so that I can live happily ever after. And so, I mean, some of you younger adults, you know, you know, God, I need you to find me the right spouse. And then we need to have our 2.3 kids. And then after, after we have our 2.3 kids, who, by the way, are going to be scholars and, and athletes um, and everything else. And then they're going to grow up and make lots of money so they can take care of me. I need that, God. And then, and then I need everybody to stay healthy. God, I need that so that I can look back on my life. And yeah, I know I'm going to die. But when I die, I just want to look at it and go, man, we lived happily ever after. It was always wonderful. That's a wrong view of God. God is not the fairy tale God who sent his son to die so that you can be happy and comfortable. That's not what that, the, the cross was about. The other way we view God, the third way we view God is that we, we treat God the way that the Roman population and the Jewish population treated the Roman judges. We, we believe we can at some level buy God you're going, no, I don't think I can buy God. I'm not sure, certain I can do that. Well, if we're not certain we can buy God, we sure do bargain with him a lot, don't we? Now, God, if you'll do this, then I'll do this. Huh? Yeah. We, we're, we're no better than the story Jesus was told and the people in that culture. We're treating him as if he's a God who now owes us. Wait a second, God. I, I go to church. I go to church. I had a couple people today tell me as they were coming through the door, and I get this, man. I, I really get this. Whew. I didn't want to come today. I, I could have easily not been here today, but I just told the devil, I'm coming. And I said, well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. 
Well, see, now that you're here, you could, you could walk in and go, well, I, now, God, you know, I didn't want to go to church, but I went to church. Exactly. Exactly. Not only did I go to church, I even, this time, I sang. Yeah. <laughs> I even gave it one of these. <laughs> and you know, God, that person that, you know, I'm not really getting along with, I smiled at him. And then the big one, then the big one. And I even worked in Kids Rock. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We we throw it out there. We make us, God, I mean, look at me. I'm a good person and I'm doing all this so take care of me. You owe me. We, We tend to have a little bargaining with God. And when we do, it's a wrong view of who God is. And it's a wrong view of what our prayers should be. So that's one of the reasons we give up on praying, because it doesn't work out the way we think it should work out. Uh, We give up on praying at times because we believe that God doesn't care enough to answer our prayer. Now, I'm going to say the obvious here that some of you have already had going through your mind. Maybe the reason, we'll deal more with this next week, But maybe the reason you're keeping praying for something but it's not happening is because God has said no. No is an answer. It's not an answer we want. We don't want God to tell us no, but he does. And so so we, we we can get that sense that he doesn't care enough to answer our prayer or it seems like he's not answering our prayer. I want to share three scriptures with you. Actually, I'm going to give you a fourth that's not going to be on the overhead. But I I just want you to listen to the scripture and just let God's word speak to you here about God's care for you. I'll give you these three passages on the overhead. In Psalm 103, God says through the psalmist, As a father has what? Compassion. Compassion on his children. The Lord also has compassion on those who fear him. So, so this, this God that we're praying to, this God who has saved us, this God who lives in us, this God who we are in relationship with, he's compassionate towards us. That's his heart towards you. That's his heart towards me. Before we look at the next one on the overhead, Pat, I want to just jump back. Let me give you this one as well. This, to me, was just a gold nugget. Actually, this gold nugget came from one of the men when I was teaching up at New Beginnings uh, this past week. Uh, I, uh, Psalm 55, verse 22, where this is what the psalmist writes. Just listen to these. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. Check this out. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Now, that's a God who cares. That's a God who cares. Even though you may be in this prayer struggle, there's something going on you have been praying about and praying about, don't give up because you think God doesn't care. You keep praying because God does care. You keep praying because he does care and he's not going to let you be shaken. All right. And then we go to Isaiah chapter 49. In Isaiah 49, we get, we get this. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Zion is all of Israel. And then look at what the Lord says through Isaiah. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget. What's the next line say? I will not forget you. I will not forgive you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Listen. (laughs) I know I'm not a tattoo fan. I don't have tattoos. I don't need them. I got age marks all over me. They're tattoos now. Um, but, but anyway, tattoos, God, God is simply saying, look, I've got you. I've tattooed you on my hands. I've got you right here. I've got you in my hands. Oh, I care about you. I will not forget you. Keep praying. I will not forget you, he's saying. 
And then over in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses uh, 6 and 7, I believe. Yeah, verses 6 and 7, he says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up when? In due time. And you want to go, okay, God, it's due time. Right now? Can we do this? Check this out. Cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. Cast them on Him. If it's troubling your soul, cast them on Him. There are some people, I'm not one of those with most things, but there are some people who are what I will call, and I don't mean this in a bad way, I mean in a good way, uh, one and done prayers. Okay? They cast it on Him and they walk away from it and they're not picking it up anymore. My trouble is I cast it on Him and then I pick it back up and walk away. And, and so I I'm, I'm find myself in this constant prayer of God, take this. This is yours. I trust you. I trust that you can handle this situation. I trust that you have this. Lord, you do what you're going to do. I try over and over and over again. I finally, in those prayers also, and maybe this is something for you, when I'm praying for something, and it's, it's something that's laying heavy on the heart, and you have to, you're dealing with it before the Lord, try, after you bring your request to Him, try just saying, God, thank you that I know you have this. Thank you that you're God and I'm not. Thank you that you see the whole situation. And you know it's consuming me right now. You know it's eating me alive. But God, thank you that you haven't given up. Thank you. Just spend some time thanking Him. Spend some time praising Him. Just by yourself. Get in your little prayer closet where you're by yourself and just spend some time thanking Him and praising Him. Okay. Uh, the third thing, um, third reason we would tend to give up on praying is because God is slow to answer and we are, we find ourselves asking, what's he waiting on? Why the delay? Why the delay? Why are you making me just keep coming back to you over and over and over with this? The scriptures would tell us that everything works together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. So we know that, that what's happening will ultimately work for our good and His glory because the Scripture is going to tell us that. But at the same time, wouldn't it be nice to know the reasons? Wouldn't it be nice to know the reasons for the delays? What, what are you waiting on, God? Could you just tell me? Could you just tell me that you'll get to it next week? Could you just tell me, just if you'll endure this just a little longer, everything's going to work out fine. In the delay, when you find yourself in what I call one of the worst places to be, in the wait, when you're in the wait, be like the widow. Don't give up. She was persistent. Oh, she just kept on going. She just kept on praying. She kept on praying. She kept on praying. Be like the widow that Jesus told the story about. Sometimes uh, God answers if it's a no or if it's in a situation that turned out completely different than you thought. Sometimes he answers, but we don't accept it as, as an answer because it didn't work out like we wanted it to work out. And, and so it reminds me, and I, I'm sorry to give you this story again, for those of you who have heard it before, um, but it, it reminds me of that little story about a guy who was praying for God to rescue him. See, there was a flood that had come into the town, 
And they were telling everyone to evacuate. And so a car came by with someone in a megaphone saying, get out of the house now, the flood's coming. And the guy said, not, I'm not even worried about the flood. God's got this. I've prayed. I, I'm trusting God. And so the car goes on. The water's rising. It's rising so much that now boats are coming by the house. And a rowboat comes by the guy's house and he says, hey, the flood is going to continue to rise. The flood is going to continue to rise. So you got to you, you got to get out of the house and get in the boat now. And the guy said, hey, thanks, but no thanks. I don't need the boat right now. I don't need the boat right now because I've prayed and God's got this. He's going to take care of me. And so the boat goes on. Next thing you know, the guy's on his roof and a helicopter is overhead because the water is up in his attic and it drops a line down to him and they announce down to him, get a hold of the line. And he doesn't grab the line. Instead, he shouts back up, I've prayed about this and God's got this the guy dies he wakes up in heaven and in heaven he's got a serious question he goes you know what I've been praying about something for a long time God I prayed and trusted that you were going to rescue me what's the deal and God said look I sent you a car I sent you a boat I sent you a helicopter it wasn't the answer they wanted. It wasn't the answer that he wanted. And so because he didn't, he didn't get the answer he wanted, he just gave up on it. And sometimes we tend, uh, we tend to do that. Um, okay. Now, God, the, another, another thing we have to understand about when God delays, when he pauses the prayer. When, when, when he pauses the answer, when it seems like we're in the wait, understand this. This is something we know, but it's hard to accept when you're in the middle of it. God's timetable is not our timetable. He, he operates on a whole different scope. He has the capacity to see what we can't see. He has the capacity to know the very next moment. You don't know the next moment. You don't know anything about the next second or the next or the next or the next. We sit here knowing, though, that God does know. His timetable is not our timetable. And you uh, Listen, there's all kinds of examples in Scripture with this. There's Noah. God tells Noah to build an ark. Anybody know how long it took him to build this ark? No, yeah, you know, you guys are good. If you ask a number, you say 40. But in this case, you're wrong. <laughs> so, 100. It took him 100 years to build the ark. He heard from God. Told, God told him there's going to be a flood. There would never even been rain before. There's going to be a flood. So build an ark. He gives him the dimensions, gives him all the specs. And then, listen to this, he doesn't say anything to Noah again for another hundred years. Hundred years. Now, at some point, you're going to wake up going, while you're out there building a boat in the middle of a desert, you're, you're going to be going, did he really speak to me? I mean, was it, was it something I ate? Is it something I just thought I heard? Did he really? A hundred years. But God knew, God knew that from the time he told them a hundred years later what was going to happen. And so a hundred years later when the flood came, Noah was able to take his family and all the animals inside the ark. Two of every kind of animal. Not all the animals. Two of every kind inside the ark. Yeah. In the wait, you continue to persevere. And I imagine Noah did a lot of talking towards God. Okay, all the jeers, all the rejection. How about Abraham and Sarah? Abraham and Sarah were promised a child. Uh, does anyone, and the answer's not 40. Does anyone know, <laughs> does anyone know how old uh, Abraham was when he was told he was going to have a child? Well, no, he was, he was 75. 75 years old. He's told you're going to have a child. Now, you, 75, come on. Ladies, Men, God tells you at 75 you're going to have a baby. You're certain you're not hearing from God. 
But not only, not only did God tell him that, but then God, I'll pick it up in a minute. It's not a tragedy. Not only did God tell him that, but then he made him wait 25 years to come through with a promise. Can you imagine the talk? Could you imagine what it was like to spend 25 years pushing around an empty baby stroller? But that was, that was Abraham. He was, he was working on those. He was working on the promises of God. He was in the wait, but he waited. He waited. There's, um, there's Joseph. Those of you who know the account of Joseph, he only... He was a tattletale at the beginning. He was kind of a brat brother. But he ended up being a guy who, because of false accusations, spent 10 years in prison. 10 years in prison, and he just wasn't there. He was forgotten there. Can you imagine being a guy who was now being faithful to God and God putting you in prison, allowing you to be put in prison, and then allowing everyone to forget you? For 10 years, that's where he was. But in the wait, he trusted God. He continued to trust God. That's Joseph, who then God delivers from prison and he becomes the second in command of all of Egypt because of his faithfulness. But, so the end of the story is really good. The beginning of the story looks like your typical dysfunctional family. And right here in the middle, in the wait... It was brutal on Joseph. But yet, he remained faithful to God. God finally came through in his time, in his time. And then the last... Okay, get ready. How old was Moses when he ran away from Egypt? 40 years. How long did he live in the desert? 40. So then he would have been how many years old? 80. 80. Okay. And at 80 years old, after he was running away from God, he got, you're so smart. After, after he was running away from God, at 80 years old, God then connects with him and says, Hey, Moses, it's time for you to follow me. And then uh, it's time for you to go to Pharaoh. It's time for you to get all of these people out of slavery. This was the beginning of the nation of Israel. This is where the nation was all happening. And, and so Moses goes under protest, but he goes. And how many years did he lead these people? Forty, Forty years. He, he led these people all through the desert, and these people were nothing but a bunch of complainers and whiners. They were hard cases. There was, no, there was hardly anyone that you would pat on the back and say, man, I'm glad you're here with me. You'd find Moses going, Lord, what have you done? What have you given me? Look at these people. All they do is complain and whine and carry on. And then at the end of that series of 40 years, God takes Moses home. And doesn't even allow Moses the privilege of leading them into the promised land. He just let him get him to the edge and then took him home. But Moses didn't give up. Moses found himself, those years between 40 and 80, he found himself seriously in the wait. But yet God used him. Now listen, I don't know where you find yourself today. I don't know if you have this thing you have been praying about that God has placed on your heart. It's a struggle in your life. You, some of you may have struggles that you have surrendered to God and say, God, here, I'm done with it. I, I'm sorry. I repent of it. Forgive me. It's yours. Help me now to walk, out, walk away from this. And you walked away from it and then you turned right around and went back to it again. And you find yourself going, God, it's yours. I give you, you know, I meant it the first time, but I really mean it this time. It's yours, and you give it to him, and you walk, you've walked away from it, and it's not an issue in your life because it's Sunday, but Monday comes, and when Monday comes, it's an issue again, and you find yourself back in it again, then that's when you surrender it again. Man, you keep going. Well, God, what are you waiting on? I'm waiting for you to take this away from me. I'm waiting for you to make this go away, and God may say, you know what? I'm, 
I'm not going to take it away from you, but I'm going to give you the strength to get through it. I don't know what it is that you have been grabbing onto. I don't know what it is that, you're, you, that you've been praying about, that you've been hanging on to. I'm just saying that Jesus told us a parable that said, don't stop. Don't stop praying. Don't give up on it. You keep bringing him before the throne. You, you keep bringing that situation before the throne. You keep bringing that person before the throne. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep going. That's what Jesus is telling us here. So when we're praying for healing, there's some of you who, who have been sick and you're praying for healing. Don't stop praying for healing. Keep praying for healing. It's one of the things I've learned. Yeah, we'll bring people up at the front and, and they'll be anointed and we'll pray for them just like we did Teresa Ashley and... And by the way, this past Monday, those of you who were here praying for her, this past Monday she had her heart calf, fully expecting to have uh, stents put in and then find blockages, and they didn't. Huh. Isn't God kind of good about that? Okay? So here's the thing. You may be sitting there like this. Well, that's nice, Teresa. But I'm still dealing with it. I still got the sickness. I still got the disease. Keep praying. Amen. Why God answers and how he answers, I, I can't explain that. I, I, I don't, none of us will ever be able to explain that. He's God, we're not. But you don't quit praying. Amen. This person may have got the, an immediate answer and this person may be waiting 40 years, 100 years. 100 years, Lord, take me home by then. Um, you may, you may, uh, you you may have been praying for your spouse. Don't stop praying, God. You haven't changed him yet. Maybe that's because he's trying to change you. Okay, we'll let that go. Um, I'm just, I mean, you can't tell you everything going through my head right now. Uh, some of you have a son or a daughter that's addicted to drugs or alcohol, whatever the case is. And, and it's, it's such a bane in our, in, in our culture as a whole. We, we certainly in this area have felt some deep effects of that. And many of you have prayed for your son or your daughter or your niece or nephew or grandchild who is, who is under this, this chain of, of addiction. And you want to give up praying and God's going to say, no, don't you dare stop praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. This past week when I was over at New Beginnings and I was uh, teaching the Bible study, when I walked in, I saw three faces of... Um, guys who were back in the house because they relapsed. You know, I make it a point to go to them and say, man, I'm glad you're back. I, I hate what made you come back, but I'm so glad you found your way back here. Amen. You don't give up. That's not giving up. We pray and we pray and we pray and we pray. Well, my kids aren't like that. Well, then you ought to hit your knees and thank God your kids aren't like that. That's something worth praising Him for. Here's one. We keep praying for our nation's leaders. Hardly an amen there, isn't it? It's like, what do you mean pray for those guys? These guys are jacked up, you know? And so, and so we, we can grow tired in praying for things over and over where it seems like, wow, God, it just seems like things are so far out of control and God's going to say to you, don't give up. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep trusting Him. Persistent prayer is how we are going to fight our battles. 
It's how we're going to do it. I'm asking the praise team if they would to make their way up here at this time. And, and I want you guys, as, as they're coming, we're, go, we're going to sing this song that, that we learned last week. And, and I just, this is how we need to close this. I want you to, to begin to see that God desires for you, God desires for you to be able to keep praying. Um, I, I'll use these words, and, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to make less, I don't want it to sound like I'm making less of God, but, but really simple. Hound heaven with your prayers. Hound heaven with your prayers. By the way, I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus is going to also let you know that he is praying for you to his Father. Isn't that cool to know he's praying for you? Now, do you want him just to stop praying for you? No. no. We, thank you, Jesus, that you are doing that. Thank you that you take our petitions before the Father. Thank you for that. And so we continue to pray. We're going to be like this widow woman. We have nothing to offer God. We have nothing to bribe him with. We are simply taking him at his word. And we're saying, Father, Father, I trust you. Hear whatever you do. And I pray that as I fight this battle, as I'm in the middle of the battle, I pray I can fight this battle with prayer, knowing that you hear me, that you have this in your hand, that your timing is perfect. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Let's pray together and then we're going to sing. Go ahead and stand with me for, uh, as we get ready to pray. Father, I thank you so much that this prayer right now, it's not the end of something. It's just a moment in our lives as we come before you. Father, there's a lot of people here this morning that are fighting battles, that are going through real struggles, all kinds. And Father, I pray in your mighty name right now, that you will minister to each person. That if they find themselves in the wait, that you will give them the grace in the wait as they look forward to what you're going to do. I give you praise, honor, and glory. In the name of Jesus, amen.